people of God, the Lord be with you. Am I on? Am I going? Good, 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 good. People of God, it is good to be together today. It is good to be here. It is good to be with you. And it is good for us to come together to worship our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, the resurrected King who rules over all the earth. Um, a special welcome to you if you're visiting with us this morning um, or if you're joining us on the live stream on YouTube. Um, may God bless you with the presence of his spirit as we worship him together. Uh, my name is John Maidendorp. I'm the pastor here at New Era Christian Reformed Church. And at this church, we are growing together in relationship with God, with each other, and with our community. And that is what we strive to do as God's people here in New Era and what we hope God will do in and through us as we worship him this morning. Today is the fifth Sunday of the season of Easter, the fifth Sunday of the season of Easter, and we are called to worship with the words of Psalm 148. Let's stand, please. Psalm 148, I'll read the parts that say leader, and we can respond all together with the parts that say family. The psalmist writes, praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, shining stars. Praise him, highest heavens. Let them praise the Lord, because he created them with a word and established them forever. His decree will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. Praise him, ocean creatures and depths. Praise him, lightning and hail, snow and clouds. Praise him, mountains and hills, trees and plants. Praise him, beasts and cattle, critters and birds. Praise him, kings and all nations, princes and all rulers. Praise him, men and women, elders and youth. Let them praise the Lord, for his name is exalted above earth and heaven. God has raised up a strong king for his people, honoring his faithful ones, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord indeed. Let's sing to his holy name.
Amen. People of God, in the joy of the Lord, receive the greeting of the Lord who calls us into worship and greets us with these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. amen. We have come to tell out the story, the great things that God has done for us. And so let's sing together, tell out my soul.
people of God, you may be seated. <laughs> what? Oh, wonderful, we can sit? <laughs> How wonderful that we can sit. You know what? Sunday is about resting in the promises of God, resting in the love of the Lord, and so it is good that we sit. It is good that we sit. People of God in... Um, The season of Easter, every year the season of Easter, this season between Easter and Pentecost, which we'll be celebrating on uh, on June 5th this year, um, invites us to be attentive and to have our eyes open to the ways that Christ's resurrecting power is already at work transforming our lives world. And this is one of the beautiful things that we see in the narrative of scripture and especially in the teaching of the early church that the earliest Christians believed with all their hearts that in the person of Jesus Christ, the age to come had already broken into this present age and the new creation that God would make when Christ came again, that God will make when Christ comes again, the new creation has already already begun in those of us who are touched and transformed by the person of Jesus Christ. And so this year, our call to confession through this season of Easter has been coming to us from the book of Revelation, from the book of Revelation. And today we are called to confession by these words that the apostle writes in Revelation chapter 21. The apostle writes these words, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, look. God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the stream of life. It's in these words that we are called to confession today. And This season reminds us that the confession that we make before God isn't just to confess to him the guilt of our sins or the ways that we have wronged him. Our confession before God in this season is a recognition that God has already prepared wonderful things for us. And we glimpse these in our lives. We taste these in our lives. We, in our lives, in the, in the good things that God gives us, have a foretaste of the good things that are to come. But we recognize that there is still so much in us that keeps us from the fullness of the promises of God. And so that's what we confess. We confess, Lord, take away everything in me that keeps this from being true. Hmm? Let's come before God in this prayer of confession. We've got that? Yeah, I'll read the parts that say leader, and we can respond together with the parts that say family. Let's pray. Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, your glory outshines all the lights of heaven. We look forward with joy to your kingdom of peace, where you will dwell with your people where you will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, where the old order of things has passed away. We confess that there is so much in us 
that keeps this reality at arm's length. We are sorry for all the tears shed because of our sins, for all the deaths caused by our actions, for all the pain caused by our selfishness. Forgive us, we pray. Give us to drink of the living water. Be our God so we may be your children. Pour out on us your Holy Spirit of love and compassion and holiness. Keep sin far from us so we may rejoice in the splendor of your works while we wait in hope for the new creation you promise when Christ comes again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. People of God, hear the good news of the gospel of peace. In Jesus Christ our Lord, all our sins are washed away by his precious blood, and we are reconciled to our creator. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. The Apostle Paul writes about the transformation that the resurrection has in our lives and in the world and how we then ought to live as, as witnesses of this promise. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? Amen. Let's sing of the assurance that we have of his promise of peace by the sea of crystal, this vision of the heavenly kingdom. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Praise the Lord. We have the opportunity now to uh, give our thanks to our God. Um, and there are a few things that I want to bring to our attention um, before we worship the Lord through uh, giving our tithes and our offerings. The first is that in your bulletins this week, and uh, I think we'll do this next week too, in your bulletin you'll find a sheet that is a worship survey, a worship survey. Um, and this is something uh, that um, is going to tell me um, and the worship leadership here at New Era Christian Reformed Church how you want and are willing and available to be involved 
in our worship services, whether as a reader or a singer or a musician um, or uh, support um, in some way. And uh, so I, I, want, I, want everybody, um, I want everybody to fill this out. I want everybody to fill this out. Even if you don't want to do anything, just put your name and say, I don't want to do anything. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't care if you play the harmonica, the kazoo, the organ, or the harp. I want to know what instruments you play and what instruments you want to play uh, here for the people of God. Um, because uh, this is an important way that we use the gifts that God has given us to bless his people. Um, and so I want to encourage all of you to fill that out. And then the, the other thing that I want to remind us all of is that next week uh, in our Sunday service, May 22, we are going to be celebrating and recognizing um, the graduates who are connected to our church as we come to this season of the end of the school year and graduations and people moving on to the next chapter um, of their educational journey, the next chapter of their lives. We want to come alongside uh, these young people in our church and we want to encourage them and pray for them um, and give them gifts. And so if you... Uh, have a graduate in your family and you haven't heard from us yet, please let us know because we want to make sure that we include everyone who we can um, in, this, in this celebration as we honor um, and celebrate our graduates. I'd like to invite those who are um, going to collect the offering this morning, the deacons and those who are assigned to collect the offering to come forward at this time. Okay, let's go to God in prayer. God of life, God of glory, in this season of Easter, we praise you for your power, the power you showed us in the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. In him, you have torn in two the veil that separated us from you. And now we live in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus stayed with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection teaching them to love all people as neighbors and treat them with dignity as image bearers of God. As his disciples in this present age, we offer our prayers for the world which we are blessed to live in, for our neighbors who, are, who we are blessed to live with. We thank you for our pastor and his family. God of wisdom, you gently guide and teach us by your word and spirit. As our schools come to the end of an academic year, we pray for teachers and students. Give them the strength to end their year well. Sustain them over the summer 
and keep them in your hand. Continue to grow them into the people you are shaping them to be. We pray for a special way. We pray in a special way for the graduates who we will be celebrating next week in our worship service, whether they are finishing kindergarten, middle school, high school, or an advanced degree. Give them grace as they face this next chapter. Give them strength to stand firm against the challenges that come their way. Give them purpose to use the gifts you have given them to meet the needs of your world. Bless them, we pray. God of harvest, as the world around us burst into green life, we pray for all those whose lives and livelihood depends on the bounty of the earth. As farmers and growers and gardeners plant their seeds and tend their trees, we pray that you would bless us with a good growing season. Send the rain in its time and the sun in its time, the heat in its time and the wind in its time. Remind us in all our work that while we plant and water, you are the one who makes things grow. Sustain all who work the earth in their hard labor and grant a full and bountiful harvest. Grant to us an appreciation for the creation you have given us and our responsibility to steward it in the ways that protect life and bring you glory. Healing God, you are a great physician. And so we bring before you all who are sick and all who are recovering, whether we, we experience miracles or receive excellent medical care. We know that all healing is a gift of your mercy. We pray in a special way for our sister Elizabeth Tenbrink in Muskegon. Grant her full recovery from her hip surgery so that she can return to live in her apartment. We pray for, uh, also pray for George and Brenda Keith as she has entered the medical care facility in Hart. Be with George as he adjusts to a different way of life. Continue to be near any who are dealing with cancer and its difficulties. We think also of our church family who are not able to worship with us as they are confined to care centers or at their homes. Surround them with your love and continue to comfort those that need your comfort. God of light, open our hearts to your power, moving around us and among us and within us and before us until your glory is revealed in our love for both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion and in the healing of all that are broken. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. We have the opportunity now for the children to come down for the children's message. So kids, come on down. And uh, what do they call you? Mr. D? Mr. B. Mr. B. Mr. B uh, is going to be giving you the children's message today. You go listen to Mr. B, okay? Hey, I know most of the people here, but did you hear in the prayer that after Jesus came back from the dead, after Jesus rose from the dead, he was with his followers for how many days? Did you guys hear that? He rose after three days, that's right, but he was with his followers for 40 days. And the story that you're going to hear today in children's worship is one of the times when Jesus was with his followers. And it's how Jesus wanted to tell and show his disciples, his followers, how to care for each other. Yeah. So, before we talk about that, though, I want to talk about something else. Do any of you have pets? You do? How many do you have? What, what do you have? What do you have? You have, th oh, you have quite a few, yeah. What about you, Richard? Um, I have a fish and a dog. 
uh, fish, fish, and dog. What about the rest of you? Do you have pets? I, John Ryan, I know you have a dog, because I was at your door the other day, and he, he woof, woof, woofed me. Yeah. But, yeah, when you have a pet, what do you have to do with a pet? You have to take care of them. How do you need to take care of those pets? Like give them food and give them water. Feed them, give them water. What else? Yeah, yeah. And what do you think? You have to love them? Yeah, you got to love your pets, don't you? What did you want to say? You have to give them a bed or a bath? A bed, okay. Maybe you give them a bath sometimes too, right? Right, right, right. So, yeah, the main thing, though, is to, to love them, right? Yeah, your fish don't need a bath. No, you're right about that. <laughs> oh, you know what? You got to love them, though, and then all those other things happen. You know what? Do you know that Jesus loves you? Yeah, Jesus loves me, but not like a pet. He loves us better than a pet. He loves us like friends, and that means that he also, he's with us, and we can pray to him, and he also puts people in our lives to, do you need to eat? Any of you guys need to eat? No, you don't need to eat? Oh, you like candy? Okay, well, maybe there might be some later. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll see once. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, he sends people in our lives to do that for us, right? So he loves us that way. And you know what? The, the really cool thing about Jesus, do people still say cool? Yeah, okay. I'm a little bit older, so I don't know if people still say cool. But the really cool thing about Jesus is he wants us to love him back. And in what you see today in children's worship is he shows his followers, Peter and the others, how to love him back. How do you think he wants us to love him back? Yep, treat him like a king, right and love him and worship him and pray to him, but, but what else? You know what Jesus said to his disciples in this story you're going to hear today? He said, feed my sheep. You know what? We're all Jesus' sheep, and he wants us to love each other, care for each other, forgive each other, feed each other, be kind to each other, Oh, man, I bet you guys are going to figure that more of that out when you go to children's church, so I'm not going to preach that sermon. But I want you to listen, and all of this Jesus showed us before he went back into heaven, and now he's in heaven, and we have to be there for each other. We have to be like Jesus to each other. So I'm going to, who's, who's going with the kids? All right, I'm going to do things a little bit different. Um, I'm going to give Miss Sharon this bag, and uh, she's going to dispense the treats. Now, um, there are some things that have peanut or peanut butter in, so you're going to have to be careful with that. I think you, all you guys know about that, right, if you can't have peanuts. But here you go, and, you know, you may even have one if you like. <laughs> All right, you and me go with Miss Sharon. Thank you for all coming. See you later, John Ryan. Thanks. Let's stand and sing.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts. From the book of Acts, uh, we'll be reading from chapter 11, starting at verse 1 and reading through to verse um, 18. Acts 11, verses 1 through 18. And as we prepare to hear God's word, let's come before him in prayer. Oh, Lord our God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. We thank you for these stories, these songs, these poems, and these letters that you inspired by your Holy Spirit. For the building up of your church. Lord, we pray that as we read these holy words that he, we would hear your voice speaking to us and that the same spirit that inspired these words would come upon us and transform us into your image and your likeness. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, Lord, to open our eyes open our ears, open our minds, and open our hearts to all that it is that you would have us see and hear and know and believe. Transform us more and more so that we reflect Jesus, the living word, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts 11, beginning at verse 1, and as always, when we read God's word, we listen for God's voice. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. In other translations, it says, Peter began to tell them the whole story step by step. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice came from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift that he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Sisters and brothers in our Lord Jesus Christ, when I was in elementary school in the Dominican Republic, I went to a school where we wore uniforms every day, the same clothes, light blue shirt and khaki pants every single day of my childhood life that I went to school. And I loved it because I never really, and, and I never really thought about it until I was at a school where we didn't have to wear uniforms, to be honest. But at my elementary school, I never a single day in my life through all of elementary school, never woke up and worried about what I was going to wear. I never wondered whether my colors matched or fit together. I never spent a moment wondering how my clothes made me look. A uniform meant that I didn't have to worry about my clothes other than making sure that they were clean, of course. And since I was a kid, I didn't do my own laundry, and so I didn't worry about that either. Expectations were clear, choices were limited, and we were free to set our minds on things above. I, and I think that that's something that we all crave at some point or another in our lives, right? Order, boundaries, clear expectations, a limited scope for projects. At the first church that I served, the, the council of the church was, was mostly made up of people who worked in, in management and business, and I remember one time one of the elders of the church suggested that the church needed smart goals, that we needed smart goals for our church. And that really got the conversation going. And people were talking all about smart goals, smart goals, smart goals. But I felt like I had been left behind because it quickly became clear to me that people weren't talking about goals that were smart, goals that were intelligent. So I asked at some point when we were having this conversation, what, what are SMART goals? You're all talking about SMART goals. What are SMART goals? And the whole council recited almost in unison, strategic, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. <laughs> People who work in management know the importance of setting limits, of having clear expectations, of setting boundaries around one's work and goals. And the people of Israel in ancient times knew the importance of boundaries too. The whole Old Testament identity of the people of Israel is the history of a people set apart, a people called to holiness, to a special purpose, to be different from the nations, from the Gentiles, from the ethnoi, the goyim. And Israel's whole history is full of warnings about the corrupting influence of the nations. As Israel's entering into the promised land in particular, the Lord warns them about taking Canaanite wives and adopting Canaanite practices, knowing that his people will fall into idolatry if they associate too closely with the pagans. The whole Old Testament purity code is a set of boundaries for God's people to maintain their purity and their holiness, the type of people they could associate with, the type of people who could worship in the temple, the types of foods they could eat, the types of activities that they could engage in. And we've seen over the course of the book of Acts, if you've read through the book of Acts, we've seen Peter a few times break these purity codes without too much fanfare being made of it. According to the Old Testament, for example, exposure to a dead body makes a person unclean and unable to worship God. But we've seen Peter run into the tomb of Jesus, a place of death. We've seen Peter last Sunday run into the room where Tabitha's body is laid out, washed and robed, ready for burial. But the Spirit was at work in those places to bring life in, in a place of death. When Peter has his vision, this vision that he has of, of the sheet coming down with, with the animals and God says kill and eat, Peter is staying at the house of a man named Simon, which the text tells us, who the text tells us is a tanner. Simon the tanner. Simon the leather worker. Simon the worker of death flesh. Another unclean profession because it works in the presence of death. It works with dead things, another place of death. But the Spirit is at work there too, bringing light in the darkness. And it's here 
that Peter has a vision that directly challenges his worldview. A sheet full of animals that he is not allowed to eat comes down from heaven. And a voice from heaven tells him, Peter, kill and eat. Kill and eat. Peter says, no, no, no. No, no, no. This is a test. I know what this is. This is a test. I'm not going to fail the test. And God says, no, you got the test wrong. You got the, this is the wrong test that you're thinking. God is turning Peter's worldview upside down. God is transforming Peter. God is converting Peter again. We call this story the conversion of Cornelius because that's who Peter goes to at the prompting of the Spirit. Peter goes to a centurion named Cornelius in Caesarea. And so we call this story the conversion of Cornelius, but I think maybe it might be better called the conversion of Peter. Because Cornelius is already a follower of God. Peter gets to Cornelius' house and realizes that the Holy Spirit is already at work there. The Spirit has gone ahead of him. He's, He's lagging behind. He's the one who's late to the party. He's the one who needs to be changed. Peter's called to go to the house of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, not only a soldier, but a leader of soldiers, a worker of death violence, a pagan, a goy. And he finds there, too, the Holy Spirit is at work ahead of him, bringing the kingdom of God into the kingdoms of this world. From where we stand, of course, almost 2,000 years later, we see this as practically an inevitable part of the story, right? After the stories we've already seen in the book of Acts, stories of healing and resurrection and conversion and deliverance and martyrdom, the story of the conversion of Cornelius hardly, hardly seems like a major turning point. Every story that we see in the book of Acts changes the world, changes reality brings a new light to the transformative power of Christ's resurrection. And so to us, on on this side of the story, it's like, well, of course the gospel is extended to the Gentiles. Of course the apostles brought the gospel to the nations. But the truth of the matter is that Cornelius is the first place in the story of the church where we see ourselves in the story. The first place where we see ourselves included in the good news of the gospel of grace. Because before Cornelius, everyone who has accepted the gospel and has become part of the church of Christ so far has been of the people of Israel. Cornelius is the first Gentile to come into the church. People of God, part of the gift of the gospel is that Israel's stories become our stories. But it's important for us to remember always that we are included in the story of Israel only by God's grace, not by our heritage. And I think we sometimes forget this, don't we? If our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents were all Christians, It can be easy for us to fall into thinking that the kingdom of heaven is our birthright, our inheritance. We forget the words of the apostle from 1 Peter 2 verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Sometimes because of our nation, because our nation has its its heritage and its foundation in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it can be easy for us to fall into thinking that America is God's chosen people, a holy nation, God's special possession. And we forget the words of the apostle from 1 Peter 2 verse 11, that as Christians we live in this world as foreigners and exiles strangers among the nations of this world, longing for a kingdom not of earth, longing for the heavenly kingdom that is coming, that has come in Jesus Christ. 
We may live as citizens of the kingdoms of this world, subject to earthly powers, but our allegiance, first and foremost, is always to God's heavenly kingdom. God calls Peter to go to the house of Cornelius, and Peter does. Peter doesn't really think about what he's doing. He just follows the Spirit's lead. In fact, the Holy Spirit tells him, don't think about what you're doing. Just go, just go, just go. In, in, uh, in our translation, we read, um, where is it? In verse 12, the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. And in the Greek, the Greek word for hesitate there means something like, like don't think about it. Don't, don't pick it apart. Don't analyze it. Don't, don't judge this. Don't criticize it. Peter simply swept up in the, moment of the, in, the, in the momentum of the Spirit. He's just along for the ride, bearing witness to the good news of the gospel as God extends himself yet again to the world he loves. But our story for today comes after that story, right? Peter's already been to the house of Cornelius, and now he comes back to Jerusalem. And he's put in this awkward spot of bearing witness to God's grace to the rest of the church. And the good news that he bears is not received as good news right away. Actually, the same Greek word, the Spirit tells Peter, don't hesitate, don't don't think about it, don't analyze this. We read that same Greek word in verse 2. Peter went up to Jerusalem and the circumcised believers criticized him, judged him analyzed him, thought about what he did. (laughs) It's the opposite, right? The Spirit tells Peter not to hesitate, not to pick it apart, not to ask questions, not not to judge, but that's exactly what the believers in Jerusalem do. Peter has to defend his actions, to explain his actions, and many of us know that while it might be easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission, it can also be exhausting to constantly have to explain yourself to others, right? To constantly have your experience picked apart by question. And to us, reading this story, it might seem unjust, right? Unfair. Peter's just had this amazing experience. And shouldn't the church just celebrate together with Peter the amazing things that God is doing in the world? Don't we just lose so much time when we endlessly debate and nitpick how God is leading his church in the world, wouldn't the church be so much more effective and and faster and more relevant if we just went along with the Spirit like Peter does? Hmm. Sisters and brothers, we often become impatient when we believe that our will is God's will. But it isn't always. And I don't think that it has to be an either-or. Either we run ahead with the Spirit or we discern carefully and cautiously. In fact, I don't think it can be an either-or. I think our text today shows us that it can't be an either-or. A church that only runs along with the Spirit and never stops to test the spirits will run off a cliff. But a church that only ever discerns carefully and cautiously will die a slow and painful death by not moving at all. It's a tricky balance, to be sure. As God's people who represent the Lord in this fallen world, we don't want to be unthinking and reckless, causing embarrassment to ourselves and the church and our God. As admirable as good intentions can be, we know the harm that can be done without proper preparation or thoughtfulness. It's not for nothing that people say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But at the same time, as agents of God's resurrecting love in this world, as the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth, we don't want to be so slow in answering the needs of the world that we're closing the door after the horse has left the barn, right? Waiting until tomorrow to address the problems of yesterday. When I was in college, I joined a dorm Bible study on Henry Blackaby's famous book, experiencing God. And there was a chapter in there that I thought was hilarious because it captures this tension just perfectly. The chapter was something about following the Spirit's leading, I think, right? Like how to, how to deal with 
the voices in your head, right? How, how to, not the voices in your head, but how to deal with, like, when you feel like God is speaking to you, what to do? How do, how do, you, how do you make sense of that? And, you know, they started out, it started out with a story that made a point, I think, and then it went on to talk about how, like, so often, so often we spend so much time thinking and praying about what we think the Spirit is prompting us to do, that by the time we finally get around to acting on it, it's, it's not a prompting anymore. Like, the moment has passed, right? That, that we, we feel like we hear God calling us to do something, and we spend so much time thinking and praying about it, that by the time we actually get around to acting on that, it's, it's, it's too late, right? And so the chapter went on to talk about, like, well, when you do feel that God is prompting you to do something, how... What do you do? How do you, how do you get from the point of feeling like you're hearing God's voice to the point of acting in the world? And, and this is what it said. It said, when you feel like you hear the Spirit's calling in your life, what do you do? Step one, stop and pray. <laughs> After warning us that we stop and pray too much, the first step in the book, stop and pray. Right? First step in the book, stop and pray. And I think that highlights the tension that we feel around this, it does, doesn't it? Step one, stop and pray. Step two was discern whether this is really the voice of God in your life, right? And it went on like this, right? Just kind of playing out what it had just warned us about. People of God, discernment is a spiritual gift, but it's also a spiritual responsibility. There are some people who God blesses with, with a special eye, for separating truth from falsehood. And we praise God for those people and we listen to what they have to say. But discernment is also a responsibility for all of God's people. And it's a communal responsibility, right? We discern together what God is saying in the present and we discern together how to connect God's present word with the word he has spoken in the past, discerning the movement of the spirit that connects the past to the present and guides us into the future that God has prepared for us. Discernment pulls together the past word that God has spoken and the future promises God has given and brings the past word and the future promise to bear on the present moment where God is leading us and what God is saying to us today. The God who spoke to us in the past and the God who holds the future calls us to listen for his voice in the present moment, inviting us to join the Spirit at the edge of grace as the Creator ceaselessly extends himself to the world he loves. God invites us to discern together what he is saying to us today. And I think that Peter's story gives us a good model that balances these two things, right? Running ahead with the Spirit and spending too long in in discernment and deliberation. When we feel the Spirit calling us to go, to do something, to talk to someone, to share Christ's love, we ought to go. Don't, Don't hesitate, just go. As the Spirit says to Peter, go, don't hesitate, don't think about it. Just go. But then, After we have obeyed the Spirit's nudging, as Peter obeyed the Spirit's nudging, after we've obeyed the Spirit's nudging, it is right and good and necessary for us to bring that word, that experience, back to the body of Christ. To do that work of thinking, of analyzing, of discerning. As memories of as members of Christ's body, we bring our stories, our lives, our decisions, our ideas before Christ's body to discern together where God is leading the church and what God is doing in our world. With humility and openness, knowing that as fallen people living in this world of sin, we go wrong more often than we go right, and we think we're doing God's will as often as we're just following the selfish ambitions of our sinful hearts. Sisters and brothers, I'm, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to level with you here because there is a trend that I've noticed in our churches over these recent years that disturbs me. More and more I hear people going to their pastors, their councils, their churches, or their social media followers with a declaration that God told me this. God told me something. And the thing that I find disturbing is that almost without fail, What God tells these people is what they already thought before. 
What God tells these people is what they already believed. What they're already passionate about. You know? God told me that the church should hop on my hobby horse. God told me that the church should do what I've been trying to tell the church to do for the last 20 years. God told me that the church should do more to, to, to support the nonprofit that I started, right? And the thing that I find so dis- disturbing is that these, these supposed uh, revelations from God, this, these experiences of God speaking to people, are not presented to the church for discernment. They're presented as an authoritative word that can't be questioned, that can't be challenged. God told me this. Who are you to stand in God's way? Who are you to stand in God's way? But that's not how God works, right? When God speaks to people in Scripture, it's not very often that he tells them, you're right about everything. You go tell them. Right? I mean, I... I struggle even to think of a single story where God tells someone that their thoughts are actually his thoughts. If you can think of one, please, by all means, correct me, and I will receive that in, in humility and, and grace. And, uh, but what I see in Scripture is that when God speaks to his people, he doesn't often confirm us in our ways of thinking. When God speaks to us, we are transformed. We are changed. We are converted again like Peter is converted again. When God speaks to Peter in this story, it's not to tell him that he's right. It's to turn his world upside down, to crack open the boundaries that Peter has set on God's grace, to upset the expectations that Peter has for how God is at work in the world and the type of kingdom that God is at work to build. When God speaks to Peter in this story, it's to show him that his idea of what God is about is too small, too limited, too bound by his own prejudice and his own experience. When God speaks to Peter in this story, it's to make clear to him that right when he thought he had figured out this whole resurrection life thing, right when he thought he was going to be the hero of the story of the book of Acts, right when he thought he was the authority on how God was at work redeeming the world, the Spirit shows him that God is way ahead of him, transforming hearts and minds and homes and nations far beyond his imagination. And so Peter, in humility, comes before the church of God not to say, God told me I'm right, but to say, God told me I was wrong. Not to say, who are you to stand in God's way? But who am I to stand in God's way? People of God, it's my prayer that we may approach each other with that same spirit of humility, that same spirit of vulnerability that Peter comes before the church with, to confess before God and before each other that more often than not, we too stand in God's way, limited by our own prejudices, by our own ideas of how things ought to be. Let's pray that the Spirit would convert us just as he converted Peter so our eyes may be opened to the limitless possibilities of God's irresistible grace for all people who journey on this earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. O Lord, our God and our King, we are amazed at the way your Holy Spirit transforms people over and over and over again to bring life in the face of death, to bring light out of darkness. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of humility that Peter models in this passage. That he is humble before you to to go where he would not have thought to go on his own. That he is humble before the church to share how wrong he was before you changed his heart again. That he is humble in the face of his fellow believers to share his experience and offer it up 
to be analyzed and studied and discerned. Lord, we pray that you would give us the spirit of discernment, that as we seek your will through the winding paths of life on this earth, that you would shine through with the glory of your revelation, with the glory of your majesty, so that we may see the places where you are working already ahead of us, already among us, already out in the world. And Lord, we pray that we would follow you there. Transform us more and more every day of our lives into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless us so that we may bless you. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. We're going to sing in response uh, another song of that beautiful vision of the kingdom that God is preparing for, for his saints. Hear from all nations. Hear from all nations, all tongues, and all peoples. Oh, yeah, sorry, here you go. Yeah. Please stand. People of God, receive the blessing of the Lord. Lift up your hearts, receive God's blessing, and go in his peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
Peace.